Hi, I am Jari Kompa, also known as Sol, and I'm here to talk about some ZX Spectrum stuff. This presentation originally started as talk about the Spectrum Next, but it turned into my personal ZX Spectrum journey, so you will hear some history of how the ZX Spectrum Next came to be and uh, what it was built on. But first, a bit about my history. In the 90s I was in demo group Hysteria and we made a couple of demos, which the old PC demo scene people might recognize. I was more in a supporting role than in design graphics or code back then. I, I made tools and ran the BBS and stuff like that. In 95 I did code my first real demo, but it was unreleased at the time because we didn't feel it was good enough or something. It was released much later on when I found it and figured that what the heck. Then uh, after 96 we formed a new demo group called Trauma and I was more active in the design and coding and we made a bunch of demos, some of which were rather successful in, in, in the assembly demo party. And all, I was also a part of a music group called D, and we released a bunch of music discs. And I spent a rather long time building a music disc interface called Horse and we released a bunch of music discs using it. It had a HTML-like renderer and uh, multitasking and all, all sorts of stuff. It, it was rather crazy. Anyway, it, it just meant that I was a better programmer by then and uh, I took more active part in coding the demos and designing them. Trauma released Mind Trap, Gateways, Traumatic, the stuff I worked together when I was bored and Lineage all on assembly demo parties. Then I've, I've been an active part of uh, text mode demo competitions, so much so that you could say that I basically made the whole text mode demo scene. I ran the TMDC competition for 10 years and after that I took part in several of, of the later ones that I didn't organize and won most of the time. And finally, I have this tradition of making a demo every new year as part of the demo group Thought. Thought is uh, like a B group for demo seniors. Many, many of the members have a more serious demo group and then when they just want to do something simple and release it, they, they release it under the Tart label. But the New Year demos have become a bit more complicated sometimes. And outside of, of the demo releases you, you may know me from the Atanoa logic simulator, which I made as a, my final project project at school and tried to sell for a few years, but it, everybody said that they, they loved it and would have loved to have something like that when they were learning digi digital logic, but nobody wanted to pay for it. Then uh, I have the probably the biggest project, hobby project that I've ever made is the Soloud audio engine, which is a pretty decent audio engine for games, which started as a, from my frustration with SDL Mixer, and that it didn't do something that I wanted it to do, so I start, figured that how hard can that be, and then I've been working on that on and off for, I don't know, over seven years. Many of you probably have also sometimes visited my website, which contains Tons of stuff that I've written more or less because somebody's asked about something and then I figured that it's easier to just write a web page than keep explaining the same thing over and over again. But let's start talking about the spectrum. I was born in 1975, so I was seven and in school learning to read when the ZX Spectrum was released in 1982. 
I remember being in the living room, having a fever and uh, watching my siblings try the first things out, out with, with the Spectrum. I can't remember if we used it much as a programming device. Probably we learned about how to write, write some basic programs, but I can't remember any real projects with it. I know that many people have written games with a 48k Spectrum Basic, but I don't think we ever did. We did play a lot of games though. I remember that my father had to get replacement membranes for it because we had hit the space key so many times that the membrane had broken. Then in 2015 I turned 40 and there were some people who were interested in retro programming. Friends were doing things with Commodore 64 and uh, stuff like that. And I just got inspired that what if I take that old Spectrum and uh, do something with it? Not with BASIC, but to do something, something in machine code and do something real with it. So I went to my parents' place, found, found the old spe specky, brought, brought it back home and nursed it to life. So to look at the internals of, of the 48k Spectrum. The key thing to know about the Spectrum is that it is cheap device. Basically everything that it has has been driven by the price, how to make something usable as cheaply as possible. The whole thing is built around the Zilog Z80A CPU running at 3.5 MHz. Knowing that most of the instructions take something like four clock cycles or T states as, as the Zilog terminology goes, means that it, it's running at roughly one MIPS. There's no barrel shifter, there's no multiplication, there's no divide, so it isn't the fastest thing out there. It's also an 8-bit CPU, so the memory space that it can see is 64k. More often than not, not the Spectrums came, came not with the Zilog part, but, but with some cheap code, like the NEC part. The Spectrum contains 16 kilobytes of ROM, 48 kilobytes of RAM. 16 kilobytes of, of the RAM is called contended because it is shared with the ULA or the graphics chip, so, so to say, and 32K is uncontended. If you are more familiar with the Amiga terminology, the 16K could be called chip memory and the rest would be fast. There's also a piezo speaker uh, as the audio output. Video goes out, out from, from the TV out, output part. You would plug this into a TV and then choose a channel to see the, see the image. In modern use, there's a rather easy hack to bypass the TV output and just out output a composite signal. And the heart of the device is, is the ULA chip. The ULA comes from the words unassigned logic array or something of that sort. A modern part that, that's similar to the ULA would be an FPGA. So instead of making a real chip, the Spectrum was made with, with a programmable logic chip. There's also two audio ports, but those are for loading programs and saving programs to tape. As you can see, there are no joystick ports, there's no reset switch. The ULA can output just one graphics mode. It's a 256 by 192 bitmap, which is not linear because of reasons. You only need more memory bandwidth than would be possible if the bitmap was linear or something like this. It doesn't really matter what, what the reason for the, for the scrambled order of the bitmap is. It's just a hassle for the programmers. In addition to the bitmap, there's a 32 by 24 byte linear color map, which describes what two colors each of the 8 by 8 cells on the screen may have. So you have a bitmap, which means you have just one of two colors. The color map just says which those two colors can be. The Spectrum has a 15 color palette, mainly just primary colors and bright versions of them. And since the brightness is controlled one by one bit, it means that both of the colors in, in one cell must be either the dark versions or the light versions. There's also a bit for, for blinking which swaps between the foreground and background color. 
and then you can also choose the border color. That's the whole thing. There's no characters or character generation or tiles or anything like that. It's just raw bitmap. When you print text on the screen, it will simply copy the characters from ROM to the bitmap. Audio is, uh, like I said, said there's, there's this piezo speaker, and you can make sound by bit banging a single bit on and off. And when, when you're doing that, it takes 100% of your CPU time. So most games either didn't have any sound at all, or then they had very short chirps. And if you try to make a game that runs at 50 hertz, this is a PAL device, so the full frame rate is 50 hertz, then you and you want to have sound, then it means that you have to dedicate a significant amount of your frame time to sound. The example that I have on this slide is is from Manic Miner that, that I analyzed, and Manic Miner simply doesn't try to run at 50 hertz. It just does a bunch of things to make uh, make things run and uh, spends certain amount of time to play play sounds. The sounds that it makes would take something like 40% of frame time if, if it was trying to run, run at 50 hertz. So in Manic Miner, if you have a screen with a lot of moving stuff, the frame rate is lo lower because it just runs slower. The data storage from typically C cassette audio is rather slow. It takes it uh, the speed is one one thousand twenty three to two thousand and forty six bits per second. It's this range because zeros and ones take different time on, on the on the cassette. On average, you have something like one thousand three three hundred sixty four bits per second, which means that loading thirty two kilobytes, which is not even the whole memory of the device take over three minutes. The main input device is the keyboard, which is nicknamed a dead flesh keyboard because it's it's a rubber sheet on, on top of a membrane. The membrane itself is a two-layer one and it, the membrane outputs one eight wire and one five wire ribbon cable. The eight by five matrix can be seen in code directly. Like I said, there's no joystick port, but there's an expansion port, which meant that a lot of different peripherals were made for, for the 48K spectrum, including a lot of joystick uh, adapters. But since there's no standard, it me means that there were several different joystick standards. So typically when you run, run a ZX Spectrum game, the first thing that you can see is a menu asking if you have a Kempston or a cursor joystick or if you want to play, play with the keyboard. Now then, when writing software for the 48K Spectrum, the probably the most important thing to understand is the memory map. First you have the 16K of, of ROM. After the ROM, there's the screen memory for the bitmap, which again is not linear. And then after the bitmap, there's the color data. Then you have a bunch of data related to the to the basic, which is basically the operating system of the of the device. So if you want to do some ROM calls to print stuff on screen or something like that, you might want to leave this alone. Then there's the available memory and and then a little bit of re reserved stuff at the end of for the memory, which is the custom graphics for print, printing the ROM routine. So if, if you want to have a custom character set, you, you would put it there. But since we are doing some serious stuff, we are not going to return to basic, so all of those reserved things are pretty irrelevant. This memory map was from, from the URL breakintoprogram.co.uk, which also has a lot of interesting and useful blog posts about the Spectrum programming. Let's say that we are going to make a program that doesn't care about the basic at all, so the memory map looks more like this. You have the ROM, you have the screen memory, you have the color data, then you have a bunch of consented memory, and then you have the 32K of fast memory. And this is all the storage you will get. All your executable code, all your data, all your variables, all the buffers you want to use, your stack, everything has to be here. That's probably the biggest limitation of the 48K spectrum. 
There was also a 16K Spectrum, which looked exactly the same, ex except that you didn't get the 32K of fast memory. You had to make your programs run from the 9K or so of free memory, and this is assuming that you, are not, you don't care about the basic. So what else do we need? Interrupts. The Z80 only has a single interrupt and that occurs at the start of, of the frame or at retrace. I can't remember if it's the start of the retrace of, or the end of it, but anyway, once a frame. In order to get there, you simply enable interrupts and then execute a halt instruction, which will then halt the execution until the interrupt happens. Now the interrupt routine itself by default is in, in ROM, which is near the start of the address space. And uh, while for some cases it might not matter if the ROM routine is run, it, it does stuff like uh, scanning the keyboard and stuff like that, so it, it wastes some CPU time. So you might want to have a custom interrupt routine. The Spectrum has three interrupt modes. The one that is in use by default jumps to a fixed address, which again is in, in the ROM area. Then you have another one that jumps into basically a random address. I think it's based on some external hardware that doesn't exist for the, for the Spectrum. And the third one that can be used, you said the address of a table that contains the jump addresses for, for the ISR. So, so if you have some external hardware that says, that, okay, I want to have interrupt that does thing A, then you would put that value in, in some bus. And then when the interrupt occurs, the processor would then look, look into the table and say, that, okay, I need to jump to this address based on this value from, from the bus, and then you get the interrupt. Now, that input value is basically random so you need to have a 257 byte table at some fixed address in, in memory that you can set but there are some alignment limitations to where where it must be and then you fill it with a single value so for example if you have a table of fd so that every byte in the table is is hex value fd then when the insert occurs you will get get a jump into the address fd fd so how do i make programs for the 48 spectrum for audio, well, on the 48K Spectrum, the audio is pretty minimal, and I usually use Shiro's Beep FX library. For graphics, I've made a PC program called Image Spectrumizer, which can be used to make graphics for the Spectrum. Packaging or making the actual binaries that can be distributed, I built a tool called Macarel for make a release. And code itself I generate using SDCC, which basically means doing C or Z Z80 assembly. In more detail, since the 48K Spectrum doesn't have an audio chip, it only only has the bit banked piece of speaker. Music is largely out, out of the question. There are some crazy people like Shiro who still do make music for the piano speaker but can't really do anything else except for some really minimal animations while, while music is playing. For the commercial games that had, had music you had a main menu or something like that with, with music and that was just playing music and waiting for a key press basically. For the actual gameplay there's the short chirps that I mentioned earlier and but if you have a non-real-time game like something where you have moves then you can can have some slightly long, longer sound effects which might take several frames to play so for the graphics i made my own graphics converter there there are other tools out there for for this but they they are i started from a completely different starting point in my opinion, it's good that you can use whatever drawing program that you like. For example, you can use Photoshop or even Windows Paint with, with my, my tools. The tool will detect whenever you save the, the image to disk and then reload. And in the tool user interface itself, you can add some filters like change the saturation of, of the images and uh, add some dithering and uh, all sorts of things that since the spectrum graphics simply 
has limitations. For sprite data, which is all for all my games, is simply just black and white. I have some simpler command line tools which load PNG files and ca calculate the pre-shifted data that that, the, that is easier to put on on the on the bitmap, and then outputs those as tables that can can be load, loaded into C programs directly. The 48K applications are distributed as tape images, which can actually be turned into waveforms and, and loaded on the actual device if, if you really want to go through that. But typically they are for emulators which load them very rapidly. In order to make the tape images, there are some tools out there, but I made my own, which also adds lots of compression and stuff like that. And the basic idea is that uh, you can use the whole memory space on the spectrum with my tools. Typically, you have a basic loader that loads a chunk of data in, into into memory and then does a basic instruction that calls the start of the machine code. But this means that you have to have the basic in memory. So what Mackerel does is that it has this loader which then puts the puts itself into display memory in, a, in order to leave the whole, whole rest, rest of the mem memory alone and then decompresses the loaded data over everything in, in the in the memory space and then jumps to the start start of your program. The macro also displays some statistic in, information about how big your program is and where everything is in, in the memory space. The SDCC or small device C compiler is the main choice of uh, C compiler for, for the Z80 at the moment. At least I don't know of anything else that compares. The Z88DK does com come with another C compiler, but it generates a uh, different kind of code. The Z80DK also com comes with its own version of SDCC. The SDCC generates OK code in that uh, it's very easy for a human to beat the SDCC in optimization. But as long as you have your very critical routines, like let's say sprite drawing or such written in assembler, you can pretty much leave the rest of it as C code. The code is also pretty readable and I've used it several times as, as the starting for, point for optimizations where I haven't needed to rewrite the whole, whole routine in uh, Z80 assembly but uh, I could just take the code that SDCC generates and start optimizing from it. One of the bad sides of, of the SDCC is that the assembler that it uses isn't very great. It also uses a slightly different syntax than, than other Z80 as assemblers, so whenever I needed to use code by somebody else, I, I would have to do some conversion by hand. And there's things missing like macros and stuff like that, but it works, I guess. So, why you see? Well, the primary reason to write in C is that it's not assembler. It's easy, it's generally easier to write C code than, than assembler code, and faster at least. You don't need to care about stack and stuff like that. And when writing some complex algorithms, like if, if you want to make a, write a triangle rasterizer or some, something like that, you, you might want to first get it working on PC with, with, with a debugger and then port that over over to the spectrum and this you pretty much can't do if you if you're writing in assembler directly now then why not write c well the primary reason not to use c is that it's not assembler because well the performance stuff aside you have a general loss of control you you don't know where your co code actually exactly is your code size might be all over the place how much stack you are using some routines might benefit having absolute address of code you can't do stuff like uh, self-modifying code and stuff like that but as usual, most of your code isn't going to require all the speed all the time. So a mixed C and C, C and assembler code base is usually the best way to go.
SDC itself is not just a normal C compiler. It has a lot of extensions for, for the small devices. Like you can declare a variable and say that, okay, this variable is in this exact memory location. And if you are doing some out outputs and inputs to ports, you can declare those in C and then use them as a normal variables and, and it just generates the code code to do the outs and ins. You can also set the start address, your the start of your actual code and so, so on using SDCC. Now, the way that I'm using SDCC is that I don't have a standard library, which means that since the Z80 doesn't have a division instruction, there is no division in C or multiplication. There's no memory allocation, no printf. All of those things have to be written from scratch. There is an alternative. You can use Z88DK, which has standard library and it handles all sorts of things for you. But that's kind of a problem for me because I don't want to give up that control that I kind of want to be in control, but still not so much that I, I'd write everything in assembly. If you are get, getting into Spectrum development, do check out Z88DK, but it's just not for me. So, how do, does this toolchain deal with the memory map? First of all, where's the code? Where, where do you put the code? If, if the code needs to be fast, then you probably don't want to put that in the con contended memory. Where do you put the stack? Where do you put the data? What data? If the data is not performance critical, like you might actually store some stuff compressed, then you can put that in the contended memory. And when you decompress it, you, the target buffer might be in the fast memory. All of these things vary from project to project. So, for example, in, in a real-time game, I would put everything possible in the in the fast memory. But then, when I'm writing a game engine where which is not real-time, then I would want to plan things so so that I'm using the memory as efficiently as possible and just use as many bytes as I as I possibly can. But then, since since this is C and we don't know exactly how much how much space everything takes, there's the possibility of, of overlaps. Like if your stack writes over your code, that's bad. Your stack might write over your data, that's probably also bad. Or your data might write over your stack. That's pretty much the bane of C programming on, on the Z80. So the tools that I've written, like the Mackerel tool, which shows shows the memory map, that, that helps somewhat. If, if I see that, okay, I o o only have a few kilobytes where the stack is, and uh, then I have some function that allocates a big buffer in stack or something like that, that, that that's probably a problem. I've also written some scripts that analyze the logs from, from the linker so that I can see how many bytes each function takes without having to look at the actual assembler listings. So if I need to optimize for space, which eventually always happens on, on 48k, then these scripts are very useful. If, if I can see that some function that really shouldn't take that, that much space is eating a lot of space, then the logs will tell me. So what have I actually released on the 48k spectrum? I did a bunch of early experiments which were more or less demo effects, but I never really made a demo because I really think that demos should have a soundtrack and the 48k spectrum music isn't... well, it isn't. So then I started looking at making some games. I made a shoot 'em up called Solar Gun, which was pretty much a continuation from from the demo effects. It runs at 50 hertz. And it has a <laughs> it has a scroller and uh, some fancy interlacing stuff. Then I participated in a Ludum Dare 48 hour competition and figured out what the heck I, I'm going to make a Spectrum game and well, it's really nothing special. There you go. And the most finished game that I made is called Maseract. I actually got graphics made by somebody who knows how to do graphics. It's a puzzle game where you have to navigate a 3D maze and you only see a 2D slice of it at a time. 
Then I started making game engines. I made a trivia game engine inspired from thread on, on the World of Spectrum forums. I found some data sets for, for trivia questions and made a b- bunch of trivia games based on, on this engine. I don't think anyone else has touched the engine, but it, it has been written so that it's possible to use it without having to code anything. You just add the data and uh, it will output another QT48K game. And then I wrote a multiple choice adventure game engine and this has been used by some other people I think in Spain but there's a compiler and uh, all sorts of funny stuff it supports images, it supports sound effects, it supports custom code libraries if, if you want to input your own code there and after making some sample stuff with it, I never really touched it again. But that's one thing that I, I'm planning to revisit in the future. The 48k storage limitation is actually rather steep when, when you think about storing text, because text takes surprising amounts of space, especially if you include some images. So, after the 48k spectrum, I did get a 128k spectrum, the plus 2 model to be exact, and I went through through the trouble of fixing it so that it runs and I can get an image and and so on, which actually required me to desolder some some transistors and swap them around, because apparently they were the wrong way around from the factory. But then I simply didn't do anything with it. Looking at what it would have added, there, there's a double buffering system, there's the AY sound chip, some some additional banked memory, and I think it has a reset button, and the keyboard is not dead flash, but it's not very good in my opinion. I don't know why I never actually did anything with it, it just felt like it would require a lot, a lot of effort to update Mackerel to output 128k stuff and the additions didn't really feel worth it. The sound chip might be, but the audio output was so noisy from this particular device that I didn't really explore what, what it would sound like. So. It went to my shelf to gather dust and uh, then a bunch of years went by, so we would have to ask what next. I had heard of the TB Blue project way before the Spectrum Next kickstarted in 2017 and everything that I've heard sounded really promising because uh, most of the retro computing projects back then were just aimed at a minimal implementation that lets you play the old games. Some of them even had reduced keyboards that only had the keys that you need to play games while the TB Blue was aiming to have a whole hardware implementation that would cover not only the old hardware but also lots of the new clones and uh, also the extensions that would bring it to the future. So when the kickstart in 2017 happened I jumped on it and while the developer boards did ship in time within a year from the kickstarter the cased versions did take their sweet time and only shipped in 2020. So I've only had a few months to play with this and uh, well I could have used the time better but I have a lot of other interests to waste my time on so I haven't gotten that deep into the next yet. So a little bit of history. The 48k Spectrum was the third ZX computer from Sinclair. Extremely cheap home computers with very limited capabilities. Only after the 48k came out it had the critical mass of features like a graphics chip that would show the image while something else was going on, for example. I never used the 80 or 81 so I'm probably a bit too critical about those. Since the 48 was a successful machine and a very simple design, it was widely cloned. There were at least two lines of uh, official clones, which naturally also uh, added some enhancements. And there were tons and tons of unofficial clones, especially in the former Soviet Union, who couldn't, uh, for historical reasons, really have the Western devices in there. 
After the 48K Spectrum, there were also official sequels, the 128K versions, which came to be because there was a tax reform in Spain and uh, they made some weird rule that these hobby computers must be taxed. And the limit that they said that, that okay, anything that has 64k of memory or less, that that's a hobby computer. Anything more is is a, a serious machine, and that that means that they don't need to be taxed as as much. So naturally, the 128k spectrum came to be. Also because the spectrum was so limited and had the expansion port, tons and tons of external peripherals and exp- expansions came to be, both from Sinclair and from different companies. So that also expanded the stuff that the spectrum could do. So the spectrum next is basically the best of all worlds, pulling many of the enhancements from from all of those clones, as well as lots of the expansions that, that different people have made. And on top of that, it also has a bunch of its own enhancements. The idea was that what if Sinclair did continue developing the machine further, what what would it have looked like? But it's not really only that, because it has a bunch of modern features, such as SD card as, as the input, which naturally wouldn't have existed in 92. It also has a massive amount of memory, which would have been a bit out of place in the 90s, early 90s at least. Now finally let's look at the hardware. The heart of the machine is a Z80, or what it's called Z80N, because it's uh, it has some additional instructions such as multiplication and uh, a barrel shifter and stuff like that. It also has a bunch of t- turbo modes, so it can run at maximum 28 MHz. The 28 MHz mode does have some caveats in that some of the instructions take a bit longer than in in the slower turbo modes, but it's still way faster than the original machine. The next has uh, up to 2 MB of memory. In practice, I don't think that many people will keep the 1 MB that was the standard for, for the first Kickstarter. I have a machine from the first Kickstarter and I have added the one, one megabyte extra memory. It's very cheap and easy upgrade. Out of the two megabytes, about 1.8 megabytes is directly usable. And then there's the graphics capabilities. In addition to the old ULA graphics mode, there's multiple different modes, 256 color palette, palette modes, there's hardware sprites, layered graphics so that you have these different modes on screen at the same time with, with uh, some color saying that okay this is this is a, a see-through color so you, you can see under the layer. The video out is no longer TV, there's a modern VGA, RGB and HDMI output. The timings of these is an interesting topic that I am not going to get into in this presentation, but it is something that you will need if you start playing with the next. Basically, original Spectrum was a 50Hz machine because it's PAL and modern HDMI is 60 Hertz so there's some interesting stuff going on there. For audio the speaker interface still exists. You can actually put a piezo speaker into the next itself if you really want to but it doesn't ship with one. Instead the audio comes out from the either HDMI or the dedicated audio out. And then there's three AI chips instead of one that was in the 128k spectrum or two that was in the turbo sound external peripheral. You can also play play samples, but that's a bit more involved as far as I know. I haven't tried that yet. For media access, you can still load from tapes if you if there's something wrong with you. But there's the SD card which can load tap files inst- instantly, like like the emulators would. Or you can use the Raspberry Pi uh, accelerator to turn those into WAV files and and wait for those three minutes or more for your games to load if you really want to. And then there's the WLAN which is less utilized than you would think, but we'll get to that later. Yeah. Uh-huh.
The keyboard is really nice. There's two joystick ports, port for PS mouse, and you can also plug an external PS2 keyboard in it if, if you want to. And there's the expansion port if, if there's some really old expansion device that you want to use. As a word of warning, if you have an old Spectrum and you get the next, the power units seem like they work the same, but the polarity is reversed, so if you mix your PSUs, you will fry either your old machine or the next. One thing that happened on the way to the next was the disk operating system, and the Spectrum Next has its own version. And this means that you are not alone anymore. You can still take over the whole machine if you want to, but it's usually a good idea to play, play nice. There's a couple of different kinds of executables. There's so-called dot programs, because you can call them from, from basic by starting with a dot and then writing the command name, which means that the basic will run your program and then return back. You can also pass command line parameters and stuff like this. And if you're making a dot program then suddenly it makes sense to not write over all, all of the stuff that basic cares about because you are going to return to basic there's also a convenient format dot next which is meant for big programmers that take over the whole machine and need a reset to return. You can write a next program that, that exits cleanly, but if you are really going to try to use everything in the machine, you probably don't need to. Apart from these two formats, all of the old formats still work. You can make tape files. There's a bunch of emulator snapshots that, that the next can also load. Now then, the Z80 can only see 64k of memory, but the next has 2 megabytes, so how do we access those? Naturally, that, that's done with banking, and there's a lot of historical ways of doing the banking, so it gets a bit messy. The original 128k spec Spectrum had uh, 16k banks, and you could only bank to the last 16k of the memory space. There's a special all RAM mode that was introduced in order to su support CPM in so some version of, of the Spectrum, and the ROMs also got a bit crowded because you can o only have the 16k of ROM visible at the time. There's a bunch of ROM banks and there's a different banking mechanism to swap between the different ROMs. The next introduces a very flexible and easy banking system. The whole memory is split into 8, eight kilobyte pages and you can swap out any of those and even map everything to the same or whatever you want. But the old mechanisms are still there and they may override the new mechanism, so you just have to keep that in mind. And why can't we just map the whole 2 megabytes? Well, the 256k that are not available directly are taken by multi-phase RAM, div MMC RAM, and a bunch of ROM pages. So basically, if you want to access the disk, then don't worry about it, just leave them alone. About 128k of reserved 256k can still be accessed relatively easily, but it's still much more of a hassle than, than the, the rest. So, well, this is an 8-bit machine. If you really feel that 1.8 megs isn't enough, you're probably doing something wrong. Now, the 48k Spectrum, like I've said multiple times, was extremely simple. There was just one port that you could use to control all of the features, like reading the keyboard, changing the border color, outputting audio, and so on. Everything happened in, in the one port, one 8-bit port. Now, the next has over 25 ports and about 100 configuration registers. So this a lot more going on. Of course, you don't need to use everything. You probably won't use everything, especially since there's a lot of historical stuff that you are not going to touch. And everything is still quite manageable, and the documentation is pretty great. And if there's a problem with the documentation, there's a very active Discord where people point out problems with the documentation, and this gets fixed pretty, pretty quickly.
Okay, let's say you don't have hardware and you want to do something for the next, or you have the next but still want to develop on, on your PC instead of working directly with the hardware, you can use emulators. But first of all, there are no perfect emulators because the next does a lot of things at the same time and that isn't really doesn't make the emulation easy second because of the previous point the emulators require a lot of processing power so you better have a rather high-end pc to run them then transferring files to the emulators is not trivial because the emulators need to emulate the actual drive mechanics instead of just saying that okay here's a file system you you need sectors and whatever to, to emulate so transferring files to the emulators is not trivial you need to do need to use some external tools to play with the drive images and stuff like that all that said there's two emulators there's cspect and uh, these are gooks or however you are meant to pronounce that anyway. I use neither, so I can't really say which are better or worse. I'm, I'm under the impression that one of them emulates better, the other is faster. But other than that, if you want to look into them better, look into both of them and see which one you like better. Now, ignoring the emulators, the basic cycle of developing on the Spectrum Next is to copy your file on an SD card, eject the SD card, insert the card in, in the Next, reboot the Next, because Next happens to know this, not the card has been gone for a while, run your program, eject the SD card, start over again. I actually developed a couple of programs this way, or a couple of test programs, and then figured that there must be a better way. Now, there's some Wi-Fi enabled SD cards on the market, which are surprisingly popular with Next developers, which you can just drag and drop files on your PC to a folder and then they appear on the SD card. But I didn't really want to invest on one of those. And anyway, the Next does have the WLAN capability, so why not use that? So I wrote a new tool called NextSync, which can be used to transfer files to the Next. I actually, I'm actually surprised nobody did anything like this before, because the development boards have been around for three years, and it was the, it was pretty obvious to me that something like this has to exist once I got, got my next. I wrote a server that's about 300 lines of Python that's running on PC and then I wrote a .command on the next so you can run it from a basic script if you, if you want to for example. After this you build your program on, on the PC, have it copied to the folder that the sync, sync is looking at, run .sync on, on the next and then you can just run your program and repeat. It's much more convenient than swapping the SD card around. So let's look a bit more at the dot commands. The dot commands are kind of like good old msdos.com files, which are all code, there's no header, they are executed from a specific address. But while the com files on PC were about 64k, the maximum length of a dot file is 8k. You can extend that 8K with some work by allocating more memory blocks, loading your code from disk to, to those blocks and so on. But it's a bit of a hassle. If, if you can keep it to 8K, things are pretty easy. There are com commands can access the operating system, so you can load files, save files, allocate memory, whatever. So they are very handy for small tools and the next ships with a bunch of commands already. Now the next programs, like I said, are me meant for big programs and they don't need to return to basic. The next loader itself is a dot program which configures the next to a more or less known state. There are some configuration registers that you still should always set yourself like like the location of the layer 2 graphics and then it loads the program in, into memory. Nothing stops programs still from loading more stuff off, off disk as long as you haven't messed up the operating system by for example writing over it in memory. There are some banks that you should leave alone if you want to use the operating system.
The memory map and planning where you put your stuff still matters. If you need the operating system, then you should keep the ROM around and also keep those few banks around the operating system. Depends on. The ROM itself can be mapped in and out as needed. Now, you need to figure out where you are going to put your code, where you're going to put your stack. If you are swapping data in and out, well, that's pretty simple. You just say that, okay, this bank is always for data. I can swap in, in and out or whatever, but if you're swapping out code, you probably want the code that does the swapping to stay in memory and not swap under it. And of course, if you are swapping out your stack, that's a bit dangerous, but it's possible. The good news is that there's no contented memory anymore. But on the other hand, there are some memory banks that are special. The development wiki has a handy list of things that you should uh, keep in mind. Like the ULA memory, for example, has to be in special place because of the required timing. The graphics itself is rather interesting pile of things. There's a background color if all the layers are invisible, you can define what the background color is. The ULA screen is still a thing and there's extended versions of those from the Timex clones. There's ULA plus, there's ULA next for some more highly controlled color stuff and stuff like that. There's a low res mode that's 128 by 96 pixels which is really low resolution but then again you have very limited processing power so if you are going to do some so-called shader graphics kind of stuff it's probably something to look into and it's also linear unlike the ula so it's much more handy there's a sprite layer you can also alter which layer is in which position so you can put the sprites on top of the graphics or under them for example then there's the so-called layer 2, which is primarily 256 by 192 pixels, which is the same resolution as, as the ULA, but you have one, one byte per pixel. But there's other resolutions too, 320 by 256, which is interesting in a memory layout point of view, and 640 by 256, and 16 colors for some really high, high resolution graphics. There's also a tile map layer, which is basically a text mode, but all of the 8x8 characters can have 16 colors each. Many of these layers have a separate palette, so you can have either completely different ki kinds of colors for different layers that can be seen through, or you can do palette tricks on separate layers with, a, with their se separate palettes. There are some limitations to how you mix these. For example, the ULA layer shares some stuff with the tile map layer and uh, the low resolution layer. There are some limits, but there's a lot of things that can be done with all of this. So let's look at the layer 2 graphics. The resolution is the 256 by 192. You could say that's the mode 13H or next. Mode 13H was the MS-DOS VGA resolution of 320 by 200, which was just turn it on and just start plotting pixels. Now that's 48 kilobytes of data and we only see 64K at a time, so you basically have to swap banks or if you want to you can just swap out the rom map the 48k to the top 48k and just run your programming at the bottom 16k that's entirely possible too each 8k bank is 32 lines the 320 by 256 mode is actually rotated so that the rows and columns are, are swapped so it's like sideways in memory but it takes 64k so you will definitely need to swap things in and out talking of palette the color selection is 256 colors out of 512 so the color space is eight colors by eight colors by eight colors which also means that there's only eight pure shades of gray the good side is that all of the good old palette tricks are back, so you can have very cheap fade-ins, fade-outs, desaturation stuff. You can have palette cycling, so if you want, want your water to ripple without any plotting any pixels, that's very easy. Or you can do cross-fading between two 16-color images very easily, or 8 and 32. All those things are usable. And remembering that different layers have their own palettes, you can mi mix and match 
all of these tricks with several layers. The interrupt stuff, all of the old stuff still works, so, so you can still create your jump table and, and all, all of that stuff, but since the default interrupt routine points at ROM, and you can get rid of the ROM, there's a much easier way to, to handle the interrupts now. You just swap out the ROM, put in your code in the first memory bank, and just it just gets called. The interrupt line can also be changed very easily. There's a one next register that just says that, okay, this is a scan line that triggers the interrupt. And if you want an interrupt to happen on a different rate than once per display refresh, that's also possible by changing the interrupt line on every interrupt. In addition to all of this, there's a lot of other things that can be used for hardware triggery. There, there's a copper, which is a, an idea taken from the Amiga, which is a very simple core processor that executes on every scan line. You can do the tricks with, with the different graphics layers. The graphics layers themselves have different offset registers. You can change the memory offset from where the layers read their graphics. You can play with clip regions and, and stuff like that. And even though the original ULA layer is pretty crappy, it's still there, so it, it might be useful for something. Now then, my Spectrum Next toolchain doesn't really exist yet. There's, there's a lot of holes in, in my development toolkit, but it's getting there slowly. I'm still using SDCC for programming. There's a bunch of open questions with that, like what if the programmers get bigger than 16 kilobytes or bigger than 32 kilobytes, what, what will they do? I, could, I can make code overlays that are basically separate programs that get compiled and then loaded to specific positions in memory and then called, for example. But that's something that I'll deal with, with when when I get there. Converting the graphics should be pretty much easier this time because everything is 8-bit palette stuff and even though the color depth is very limited it's still far cry from the problems with, with the ULA graphics mode. As for audio, I can currently play register dumps made for the sound chips but that's not a really lasting solution so in the very long run, something like a VST that simulates the sound chips and then making some kind of a converter that takes in MIDI files and, and the VST's configuration and then, then generates some, some player code. That's That might be something that works in the long run. There are some trackers and uh, stuff like that for the AY chips already. As for the final packaging and making releases, some kind of a mackerel kind of solution would be nice, especially if it helps with, with a memory map and finds problems before executing. The next thing was a big puzzle piece because it, it makes development on the device much more enjoyable. And if I find some other pieces that require those programs, that, that's probably what I will do. Finally, I'll leave you with, with a huge list of links for all the source code that I've done, all the tools that I've done, and all those links to various communities and, and tools that I'm using. So, that's where I am with my Spectrum journey. I hope this has been, if not entertaining, at least useful. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Bye!